Hello, how's it going, guys? Hello. Uh, one more round of applause for, uh, for River Blue. <laughs> My name is Jordan Carlos. I will be hosting uh, a panel that we'll, be, um, that we'll be doing right now um, to discuss the film. Um, if I can, if I could have the panelists please come up. Uh, uh, Carrie, Carrie Summers, Marcy Zeroff, of course, and Roger Williams, please uh, join me up here on stage. Okay. Yeah, it's at the bottom. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Roger, congratulations on the film. It was really great. I think um, a question that everybody is uh, wondering after seeing its powerful images is, how did you get Jason Priestley to narrate it uh, from 90210? Um, Niner, yeah. 90210, yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, actually, uh, I've known Jason for a few years, and uh, he's actually part of Oceana, which is, which is a um, kind of a lobbyist group in um, Washington that is run by Ted Danson. So he's been a long time water advocate, and when I showed him the film, he was just like, yeah, I want to do it. There's yeah. no problem. Amazing. The priest. That's awesome. The um, priest. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. Well, it made my dreams come true. So um, let me ask you this. How did you get so much access uh, to so many of these, I mean, what we would label as sweatshops, things like that? Because um, as far as I'm concerned, is I'm just like, uh, you know, your, your standard American consumer. I think that a lot of it is like black box and shrouded in secrecy. However, you were able to do that. Yeah, we were actually able to kind of break through and get into that, but that did take a lot of time and effort in working with locals uh, who have the local knowledge and the access. And uh, yeah, it was just keep going and digging and digging and finding the right people to get us the right, uh, right access. And ultimately, getting into those um, factories was, once you knew the right people, they were actually happy to have us in. Mm -hmm. They had stories to tell. Um, speaking of which, uh, let's go around, uh, if we can, and uh, just, you know, say a little bit about yourselves. So, Roger, I'll start with you. Sure. Again, Roger Williams, uh, as I mentioned at the start. Uh, I've been involved in the film industry a long time, but I really wanted to do an environmental film, and so came up with River Blue. Hi, I'm Marcy Zeroff. Uh, I actually started in the food industry, so my, my fashion background is that I got best dressed in high school. Um, and, uh, and actually, um, having been in the food industry, I learned a lot about the impacts of our food system and stumbled across um, cotton as the leading, one of the leading causes of air and water pollution in terms of the most heavily sprayed industry in agriculture and the dirtiest crop in agriculture. And that opened my eyes. And um, in 1995, I coined the term eco-fashion. People thought I was insane. Uh, and I rolled my sleeves up to kind of take what I had learned in the fashion, in the food industry, and apply it to the fashion industry. So I started a brand called Under the Canopy in 1995, which was the first sustainable fashion and home brand. Um, and then built that and sold to major retailers. Uh, and then today, I started a factory called Metaware, which is uh, my way of bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. and reigniting the organic cotton uh, industry here in America. Hi, I'm Carrie Summers. I'm the founder of Fashion Revolution. Um, I started in the fashion industry 25 years ago when I, rather by accident, set up my own brand, Patricuti, um, starting producing in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia with knitwear, and eventually Patricuti. I'll switch it. Um, I started in fashion 25 years ago and started with my own brand, Patricuti, which was a fully transparent, traceable brand, sustainable. It was the first um, company in the world to be fair trade certified by the World Fair Trade Organization. And then after the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh, I think everybody knew that the industry had to change, that had to stand for something, and that we couldn't let those lives be lost without really seeing transformation in the fashion industry. And 
um, I had the idea of founding Fashion Revolution, which has now grown to a global campaign in over 100 countries around the world. Yes, well, I mean, it seems, you, you touched on uh, Rana Plaza. It, it seems that, uh, that that seems to be the benchmark. Everybody knows about that horrible disaster. It's, it's almost like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, in a way. Um, I, I would ask this, though. We seem to find ourselves like in, on this infinity loop, right? Where um, why does the industry continue to struggle with the environmental and social tragedies like polluted waterways, um, unsafe working conditions, slave labor, and low wages? Like, why does this keep happening? I know that's a very broad question. If you can answer it in five words, that'd be awesome. Um, no, uh, but but why does this uh, keep happening? In, in in your opinions, money. That was awesome. You did that in less than five words. It's great. So uh, as an extension of that, because that really is the driving force, um, what people don't realize is that um, a garment can change hands seven to ten times in the supply chain. And there are so many um, variables and factors in creating a garment, and there's so much subcontracting going on. And as fast fashion retailers have gone, you know, the fashion industry has gone from four seasons a year to 52 seasons a year, the proliferation of fashion has created just absolutely untenable conditions worldwide from um, the supply chains just trying to keep up with the fashion industry. And so um, all of the subcontracting that's going on is creating these kind of secrets behind the scenes. So. You saw in the film, you know, the gap, they think they're doing the right thing, but the company that they're hiring is hiring and, you know, other contractors. And those are the ones that are oftentimes, there's sort of this facade. And those are the ones oftentimes that behind the scenes, um, the, the subcontracted factories are where you see so much exploitation and so much pollution. And, and um, I just got back from India yesterday and it was mind blowing how little these factory workers and farmers who are not part of the sustainable system, how little they really know. They don't really understand that they're getting poisoned. I mean, they're still swimming in these waters. They're yes. still drinking the water. So it's, it's pretty eye-opening. And we need to educate just, just as much as we need to educate consumers here about, you know, getting out of that mindset of faster, cheaper, more, and buying quality and empowering people that you know, that what you choose actually matters to people across the world, the, the products that you choose. Um, we also have to educate the people across the world um, about the opportunities for more ethical and sustainable practices, manufacturing and materials. But faster, cheaper, stronger, I mean, can it last? I mean, it, it seems so unsustainable. And what happens when we run out of road um, in the in the uh, the experiment that we've set up, you know, um, what I mean are there um, are there new ways of creating uh, clothes that we we saw in the documentary? But like, you know, what are the obstacles between where we are now and those kind of amazing new uh, technologies? Again, uh, are you gonna say money again? For, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, partly. Um, but you know, again, all those new technologies, I've just come across a bunch of new technologies in the last six months that are R&D only right now. They need somebody to start kind of getting a hold of them and start working with them. Um, um, I'm sure you've heard of Pinotex, which is a pineapple leather, and there's also mushroom leather, and so there's all kinds of new technologies. Are they the answer? I'm not sure, but we have to start doing something and doing it pretty quickly, as Ursula said. Uh, when we look at the condition of our oceans, mm -hmm. They're not in very healthy shape, and so if the fish are eating all kinds of nanoplastics and microplastics, and we're eating the fish, then we're we're doing ourselves harm. So there's a lot of work to be done in a lot of different areas, um, and I just think we've got to start looking at all of these solutions and start um, asking how our clothes are made, where they're made, and and then you know go back to the larger manufacturers and say, hey, there are other solutions. Let's start moving towards them. Carrie, do you feel it's like a system, a, a function of, um, uh, of kind of like our, our behaviors wherein like, for instance, everybody maybe in this room, maybe you don't, but I'd say a large portion of people like organic food, right? And we're, we, we'd uh, pay a premium at Whole Foods, aka Whole Check, to get good organic food, right? Locally, fair traded, in season, bananas. 
We want that, right? But um, we seem to draw the line at clothes, right? At clothes, we want them cheaper. Our food will pay premiums for, for them to be like sustainable and healthy and good. So what, what do you think? Is it, is it a function of our throwaway culture? Yes, it is. I mean, brands certainly have to take more responsibility. Every year, the fashion, fashion revolution comes up with a fashion transparency index. Mm -hmm. And we're really seeing that brands aren't taking any substantive efforts um, to, to address the issue of overconsumption. Right. So only three of the brands, Burberry, Gucci, and Levi Strauss, have actually have any kind of a program to repair people's, people's clothing if they purchase that item of clothing. Only um, 14 brands were disclosing any investment in the circular economy. So it's really obvious that brands are doing very, very little in this respect. And that's why we need to educate consumers on ways in which they can, can keep their clothing for long, longer and love their clothing. What um, is the life cycle of clothing? I mean, like, do you, did you say repair? I don't know if anybody, do, do people actually repair their clothes? By round of applause, does anybody repair their clothes? Okay, that's amazing. This feels like AA, people don't like to admit to it. Um, but that's really great. I mean, I know of only a few. I know like Barber repairs jackets. I know that like uh, L.L. Bean Russell shoes. Like what could be the half-life on a garment? Um, or what do, you, what do you think could be, should be? Yes, I mean, we heard Orsler say in the film that there's 80 billion items of clothing shipped out of factories worldwide every year. That's actually an old statistic now. It's now 150 billion. So, I mean, this shows how much our consumption is growing and how quickly it's growing. I mean, at Fashion Revolution, we have ideas like the alternative. We have some of the biggest haulers in the world. The people who normally make the videos, they go shopping, they buy fast fashion and put, right. make, put a video on YouTube saying, you know, this is the so-and-so that I just bought from this shop. So we've encouraged some of the top haulers to do a whole alternative, a different way of replenishing a wardrobe without necessarily buying new clothing. So this could be a fashion fix. It could be a clothes swap with another hauler. It could be buying secondhand or vintage. You know, it could be um, upcycling an item of clothing or embellishing it. And there's plenty of ways in which we can actually love our clothes for longer. We also have a, the Fashion Revolution Love Story Challenge about finding an item of clothing in your wardrobe that means a lot to you. You know, writing a love letter to it, right? making a story, making a video. And I think we need to learn to fall back in love with our clothing right. again, rather than seeing it as something as disposable as, as food. Is it a function? I mean, yeah, we should fall in love with our clothes. I, I don't think I hang out with my, my jackets enough. But like, um, do you think also, what, what, but what part does like the hot new item play? What, what part does like, you know, it's like 20 new looks for fall, or it'll be like 50 new looks for spring, and there aren't, there aren't even 50 days sometimes in spring, I don't know. But like, you know, like... But that's marketing. That's marketing, and right. And we are marketed too all the time, every day. Right, so do we, have to, do we have to unhinge from the matrix, so to speak, and not worry so much about what's marketed towards us, or...? I think we need to look at how we're marketed to and at. Um, so I think we need to kind of disseminate and really look at how people are the big brands are marketing to us, and is that what we really need or want mm. uh, or should have? And again, what, what is the cost? And so it comes back to, as Marcy said, education. And people from high schools on up and universities, they need to you know, be more attuned to what's going on as well. Okay. Sustainability, you're saying, yeah. For sure. So how long can I make this jacket last? You won't tell me. Okay. Um. I think one thing that's really important to yep. mention here is that people think if they spend more money on an item of clothing, mm -hmm. that it's better made, that it will last longer, that the conditions have been, that, you know, that the conditions of manufacture are better. But a lot of, certainly the mass-produced luxury garments are made on exactly the same production lines in Bangladesh right. as the fast fashion brands. And they might be paying 25 cents extra because there's a bit more embellishment, you know, pocket detailing, the seams might be slightly better. But basically, you know, we've got we've got the same problems, we've got the same production lines, and what you're paying for is exactly that, it's, it's marketing. So don't be fooled into believing that because you're paying more, that the conditions are any better. And actually, a lot of the fast fashion brands are doing a lot more to invest in, in cir the circular economy. The H&M have been supporting um, a lot of research, and they just announced a breakthrough just a couple of weeks ago 
in terms of new um, chemical recycling, which is really going to completely revolutionise the okay. fashion industry. So we'll be able to separate cotton from polyesters without any degradation in the quality of those raw materials. So I think a lot of the, the cheaper fast fashion brands are doing a lot more than people give them credit for. Okay. And a lot of these sort of mass-produced luxury in particular is, is very complacent. Well, that is good news. Marcy, did you want to jump in for a second? I was going to say, yeah. there is a, a big movement now for the cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept of, you know, what we take from the earth, we have to give back to the earth and this circular economy. And so, you know, from large brands, um, high fashion brands like Stella McCartney to fast fashion brands like H&M, um, there's a lot of, of effort now to try to create more of a zero waste um, effort. And so um, when you asked about your jacket, I mean, there's companies like the Renewal Workshop that are now fixing old jackets and old clothing Isn't and that, reselling it. I got it. this like last year. It's not that old. <laughs> uh, but go ahead. <laughs> um, no, and there's a company called Ico that has yeah. now placed boxes at all the H&M stores and they're collecting old clothing and turning it into... Um, either you know fixing it to get it resold it's getting sorted or there's companies like recover now that are actually buying um, scraps from garment factories and turning it into um, turning it into fabrics they're turning it into yarns actually um, that are color sorted so and then lensing is also recycling cotton there's a lot of effort now to kind of look at how do we create a more circular movement in the fashion well, it sounds like a serious groundswell I want I want to move on to pollution if I can for a second. Um, yeah, um, so in the film, uh, we see our waterways being polluted at the hands of manufacturers and zooming out on the entire apparel industry. What is the larger system contributing to the degradation of our environment? Who else bears responsibility? What do you, what do you guys think? I actually think we all bear some of the responsibility. You know, I'm part of the problem, but I'm also part of the solution. Mm. Once I know what the problem is, I go start looking for solutions. That's how I kind of live my life. It doesn't matter if it's organic food or clothing. So now that I know a problem, I should do something about it. And that, again, is I think we all have a role to play. But, you know, I think maybe governments have a role to play, and certainly the, the manufacturers and the, the large brands, they can play a much bigger role than what they are right now. Uh, they have their subcontractors, and their subcontractors have subcontractors and all the rest of it. But I still think that they should have some responsibility to make sure that the clothing is uh, made in the best ethical manner. How much room is there between you know, um, a manufacturer and, and the brand itself, so the face of the brand? Like, if I walked into H&M and got a pair of jeans or whatever, like, how much responsibility or how much does H&M does dictate about what the what uh, that pair of jeans will look like, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm sure they have a big um, interest in what the jeans look like, but how they're created, I'm not sure that they, they really follow through. Again, they might, they all have, as uh, uh, Kumi Nadu said, you know, they all have big, thick sustainability plans, and that's wonderful, mm -hmm. but are they actually implementing that? And um, when you have, you know, those large brands, Again, I think there's just a responsibility for them to dig a little deeper and make sure they are, that they're doing something. Again, in Bangladesh, if Bangladesh actually has very strong environmental laws, but there's no will to follow them. So if you have a brand that says, well, we're trying to get our subcontractors to follow the laws of the land, well, if there's either no laws or no will to follow the laws, then what's really going to happen? A certain deliberate ignorance. So you're saying, like, it's like, my grandma would say, like, uh, it's like sausage. Everybody loves the taste, but nobody wants to know how it's made. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah, okay. I like your grandma. Uh, yeah, she's great. I <laughs> just add, though, that, um, you know, 10 years ago, um, most of the brands that were even putting their toes in the water around sustainability were, those efforts were being driven by marketing, the marketing departments. And one thing that's eye-opening and also very promising is, Today, and I'll use Target as an example because I launched the first organic program, and watching now they have a nine-tiered um, sustainability policy. They've, they've already announced a couple of those, um, including a chemical policy. Um, uh, in terms of where, the, the, uh, where they're driving sustainability today is coming from product design and development. They're actually telling marketing, you know, we'll get back to you when we're ready. And so there are more efforts than ever before. And I think it's mostly because 
it's not about staying ahead anymore, it's about not being left behind. And I think that that's empowering these retailers to actually start to get into the trenches of their supply chains because they don't want to be the next poster child for Greenpeace. Absolutely. And, and let me ask this. I'm hearing a lot of like hopeful speak here. You're, you're talking about um, fast fashion um, uh, creators that, that actually are, are using best practices. So what, is, what, uh, what gives you hope out there in the landscape? Carrie, what gives you hope? I mean, company-wise, company who have you seen? Um, well, I was in Bangladesh last week, and I was, you know, likewise really impressed at seeing some of the changes that have happened in the ready-made garment sector in, in Bangladesh. You know, we've seen um, the top three green companies, green factories in the world are in Bangladesh. Mm. Seven out of the top 13 green factories are in Bangladesh, and I believe there's like 200 more green factories in the pipeline in the next year and a half. So Bangladesh has transformed itself in a relatively short period of time into certainly the most transparent place in the world to do business as a result of the accord, the alliance, the national action plan. But really still more needs to be done and it needs to be done faster. I mean, we're seeing brands really not disclosing much about their, their assessment processes on the factories. Mm -hmm. So they're really good at dis disclosing their policies and their procedures and they're scoring really well for that in our transparency index, but they disclose much less about their audit process mm. and what happens when things go wrong and how do, they, um, how do they fix them, how do they address those issues. And so that really means that consumers have no way of knowing whether their policies and procedures are really effective and whether they're really driving change and improving conditions for the workers and for the environment. There's no metric there's, for that. No, no, there's not. And so that's something that really does still need to change. But I mean, certainly in Bangladesh, we've, we've seen a huge amount of improvements. Um, but again, you know, talking about who bears responsibility, the government has to bear a lot of the responsibility. The video we saw was in Hazari Bag in the tanneries. Mm -hmm. These have since mostly been moved to Savar. And last week, I visited the Savar tanneries. And the government has shut down Hazari Bag because of the pollution. 92 out of the 155 tanneries have moved to Savar without the infrastructure being in place. And the rivers, a different river, is now being polluted. And the effluent is just going straight out into a new river without the effluent treatment um, plant in place. So we're just sort of seeing the, the environmental pollution move from one place to another, another. one river to to another, so the government also has to bear responsibility. So I just wanted to, to add to that as a you know, really an update on the film. Yeah, more of a three-card Monty. Mm. It's like switching around. And, and uh, uh, Roger, do you, do you have, are there any Sure, I mean, think? for, on the hope side, one of the things that I'm seeing is that the younger designers, the younger designers, I think, are gravitating towards um, sustainability in a much bigger way. And, and they're looking for answers and solutions. Um, and they're nimble. You know, mm. large companies sometimes take a long time to turn that ship around. So these young guys, I think, young guys and girls, um, and young designers, I think that, that has a lot of hope for me. And I think there's a, a lot of future in those people. I would just connect the dot there to, um, there's this, um, excitement around source to story, like making the farmers cool, making the material stories important now. So um, a lot of retailers and brands now are actually looking for stories. And that is also becoming a catalyst for this movement um, because the young generations, I mean, the internet has changed the game. You know, we can pull the curtain back now and ask the questions, who made my clothes and how are they being made and where are they being made? And we couldn't do that before because we were being talked at. Now we're being engaged, and I think that that is absolutely um, probably the greatest force that's propelling sustainable fashion today. Yeah, it's very, to, to, to say where your stuff came from, the, the, the story of the sourcing is, is like, it's dinner, it's great dinner conversation. But, um, <laughs> but let, me, let me ask you, um, let me ask you this. Okay, so uh, Thanksgiving is coming up, oh no. Uh, <laughs> how will I survive? Um, followed by, of course, Black Friday, and um, what, are there any actionable steps that we can take, right? Um, uh, you know, what's something practical we can do today to not add to this, to this kind of like horrible footprint of, of uh, you know, discarding clothes or, you know, how can we do the right thing this Black Friday? I mean, everybody in this room, um, if you go shopping on Black Friday, 
Who's, I mean, come on, you guys are going to be, right? Come on, no? This guy's like, not in, not in hell. Uh, not going to do it. Okay. Maybe but for those that are going Black Friday to go shop for their loved ones, or Kwanzaa, or whatever, then, um, or Christmas, or if I left out anybody, Hanukkah. Yeah, uh, got or, them all. Or, yeah, <laughs> Ramadan. Okay, then what do we do? Slow down. Think about it a little bit more. Do you really need that, you know, fifth pair of jeans or mm -hmm. that tenth coat or whatever? Uh, so slow down is, is part of it. And then we got to, again, start thinking about what we're doing and how we're doing it. All right, I would just add, um, you know, not just buy less, but if you are going to buy, support the brands and companies that are doing good work in sustainable fashion. Buy organic uh, cotton textiles instead of conventional cotton. There's a lot of brands today that are stepping up. I mean, that industry has grown from 245 million in global organic textile sales to over 16 billion because people are stepping up and voting with their dollars now. And you talked about organic food. Um, organic cotton is super important because farmers are getting, um, you know, really poisoned in the conventional cotton chain today. Um, and and it's, not, so? it's not, so in conventional cotton, they get stuck on what we call the pesticide treadmill. They get lured in by the seed companies to use the GMO seeds, which go with uh, the toxic chemicals and sprays. Santo! Uh, is it uh, it's yeah. not that different, you know, than on food, except for the fact that um, you know, cotton, as I mentioned earlier, is very heavily sprayed with some of the worst herbicides that contain um, ingredients like glyphosate, which is now being tied to cancer and autism. Um, and the, the farmers are um, not l learning how to use all the different sprays correctly, so they think they can spray, you know, to get the bugs are building resistance to the sprays, and so they're spraying more and more. Right. And this situation is perpetuating itself into where the soil is getting destroyed and the farmers are seeing, you know, the bugs and the weeds go out of control. They're spending money they don't have. They're leveraging their farms to banks that are partnered with the seed companies and uh, they're going into despair. And every half an hour right now in India, a conventional cotton farmer is actually committing suicide. And they're doing that by drinking the pesticides. Um, it's just, it's a mess, and the system is broken. And so supporting organic cotton is a way to create not only better soil, but a better livelihood, a more sustainable livelihood for these farmers worldwide, and in our own backyard, hopefully soon. Okay. Well, being from Fashion Revolution, I would, of course, say that the one thing you should do is to ask the question, <laughs> who made my clothes? Ask the brand on social media. We've really seen such a snowball effect. We've seen so many brands over the last sort of 12, 18 months starting to publish their first tier factory lists. We're really seeing the impact of this question having an effect on brands. I was actually told after the first Fashion Revolution Day that for every one person who asked the question, who made my clothes, a brand took that as representing 10,000 people who felt the same way but couldn't be bothered to do anything about it. So I think that really shows the incredible power that we do have as individual consumers. It's kind of the, the question of like, you get that red carpet question of who are you wearing, you know? But there is a, a bigger story at hand, obviously. Um, I have a few more uh, cues before we uh, open it up um, to, to you folks in the audience. Um, let's see. Uh, what systemic challenges are unique? to the? Because I've heard you guys talk about supply chains, and I would like to know like what systemic challenges are unique to the fashion industry's supply chain. If I, if, and it's just, just throwing it. If you guys want to answer it, it's fine. Because, you know, it, it's, it's weird. It's like... You, um, we talked a little bit about it, right? The brand and then the manufacturers, they don't, it's kind of a black box. They don't want to know what's going on exactly, exactly, right? Um, I guess, is there some kind of like, what do you call it? Um, plausible deniability at play, you know? So, but you seem to, you, you uncovered a lot. I mean, how does, how do these pants get to me, right? Um, <laughs> well, through shipping. Shipping, sure. You know, shipping, I mean, sure. But I make, let's say I make an order on, um, I make an, an order, um, you know, on uh, Net-a-Porter because um, that's the kind of guy I am. And uh, then, it, then how, what, what, what happens exactly? Does it go 
has, have, the, have the pants even been made yet? Is it small batch? Is it just like some kind of like crazy sweatshop situation? Marcy probably is a better place yeah. to answer that. So some of the systemic changes are the business models in just in and of themselves, right? So, you know, buyers are incentivized by margins and merchants, and they don't want to go out of the box because they're going to make less money for themselves if they change their, you know, what is already kind of built into their system. So even if you see sustainability directors and, you know, designers stepping up, you still are seeing resistance at the buyer level, right. at the merchant level. And then what happens is they call sourcing agents across the world who don't always know the right questions to ask, but there's, you know, even when a buyer is asking for something sustainable, there's just a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of there is some cheating that goes on because there isn't enough um, today government regulation behind a lot of this. This is just the, we're starting to see the beginnings of that. In fact, when I was in Delhi last week, um, all the garment dyeing factories were closed. I don't know how many of you are aware of the pollution levels in Delhi, in Delhi yeah. last week, but 10 times um, the legal safe pollution level. Um, and and just un literally like <laughs> attest to this unbreathable. But um, you know what's what's happening is that um, even if the intentions are good, again there's so many layers. As I mentioned earlier, seven to ten times in the supply chain, it's amazing that a, a garment can sell at five dollars at a fast fashion retailer, and how many hands and systems have touched that garment along the way. So we have to be thinking about, you know, again, um, streamlining, making the supply chains more vertically integrated, more efficient, and more transparent, most importantly. So would vertical, vertical integration, I mean, it was mentioned in the film, so would vertical integration then, I mean, incentivize what, better practices, you're saying? Like, I mean, obviously, but like, um, what's the incentive not to do that anymore? Like. Well, I think it's just the way that the fashion system was built. Like I said, the business model. So like for someone like me, you know, for the last 20 plus years, I started my fashion brands and home brands by starting at the source and, and building up the supply chain from the cotton to the yarn, to the fabric, to the garment. Mm. So I knew everyone who was touching my product. But the traditional system in fashion is go to a factory and the factory is working down the system. And so the buyer, generally speaking, or the sourcing team at a brand or retailer doesn't know anyone but the final factory. So they're, it, I think you know, we're starting to see more engagement at the, you know, even H&M. I mean, they're starting to work with CNA, with farmers now. I mean, that was historically not your typical supply chain management. It, like, it seems to like echo coffee, right? Like we, we love to know that who, you know, what humble hands like pick the coffee and if there was a fair trade for it. Carrie, I, I would like to know before we before we uh, take questions from the audience, um, are, do you have like transparency all stars though? Like like some people that you think are getting it right as far as transparency is concerned, where you know exactly where you know things came from along the supply chain, exactly. Well, I don't think anybody is really getting it right in mm. the fashion transparency index. The highest score, which um, was scored by Levi's, was forty nine percent. Mm. So you know, it really shows that even the people, was, I think there was 10 people who scored above 40%, and 30% of brands scored 10% or less. So really, even the people who are, you know, get, who are really at the top of the list, they've got such a long way to go. And a lot of it is in terms of disclosing their real-time impact on the environment, on the community, on the workers. There's also issues like living wages. I mean, that's something where, you know, where we really need to see systemic change within the fashion supply chain. There was a survey of 219 fashion brands, mm -hmm. and it found that only 12% of them were actually making efforts to pay wages above the legal minimum. And so even, even where brands are involved in best practice, and we're looking at the most transparent brands, no brand's actually going to change the fashion system on its own. We can't take a factory by factory approach 
if we want to address those systemic challenges in the fashion supply chain. So it's really important for brands to engage with NGOs, multi-stakeholder initiatives, um, ACT, which is Action, Collaboration, Transformation, which is looking at addressing the issue of living wages. And we really have to see all of the stakeholders coming together to start to create change. Is that an outcrop of the fact that, like, we love fast fashion, we love that it's cheap, and then somewhere along the line, the rent that you pay is low wages, right? So mm -hmm. um, yep. can you have one um, without the other? Well, also, I heard numerous times from different factory owners in Bangladesh last week that since the Rana Plaza disaster, they had been getting between 3 to 5% less for their clothing every single year. So mm -hmm. also, how do we expect the factory owners to start to, you know, is it any wonder that they're turning off their effluent treatment plants when the buyers aren't there? Because, you know, that they're trying to save money we've got brands have got to stop squeezing the factory owners we've got to start addressing you know responsibility throughout the supply chain and brands have to start paying more for the clothes which well, wages in the united states have stayed stagnant since the 1970s maybe if we got paid more am i right guys all right so um i'm just saying it's all a cycle guys all right it's a vicious cycle so let's uh open the floor up to uh any questions that you guys might have in the audience for our lovely panel here Yes, please walk on up. I think you were first. Oh, hello. It's on. Is it on? Oh, no. Were you having the same trouble? It's on. It's on. It's on. Oh, it's it on? so on. It's so on. It's on right now? Okay. It's on. Um, I have a question particularly about um, continuing education for people who work in the industry. I work on the product development side and um, Honestly, it wasn't until I started going to CFDA meetings for sustainability that I realized all of the science behind all of this and how little can actually be recycled of fibers. How much do you think lies in brands educating those who are responsible for sourcing both factories um, and materials? So um, there are a number of really exciting collaborations that are going on right now to connect all the dots in the supply chain. So from the brands and retailers to the manufacturers to the material, uh, raw materials. Um, for instance, the textile exchange is an example of that. The textile exchange um, just had their annual conference and it was unprecedented how many attendees there were. There were I think 515 people there just happened uh, in October um, from lots and lots of just major brands. Factories were there, farmers were there, and I think we all need to be at the table having these conversations, designers, um, so that we can understand where the challenges are and work together to solve them, creating win-win business models. It takes everybody's voice at the table um, to make this work. But education is, is paramount. And I, um, to your point, I think you know, there's uh, it definitely an increased um, awareness in sort of the, the next generation of fashion brands as well as um, designers and these schools you know, like Parsons um, offering more and more sustainable design classes, which is very encouraging. What an incredible film. Roger, you're so talented. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was a good team effort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have a, a movement, a nonprofit I started called Fashion FWD. And I'm doing a lot of research along um, the same lines of how communities are affected by toxic chemicals in the process of making our clothing, communities, workers. But I'm curious, I'd love for y'all, if you, if you can, to touch on the effect that this process has on us. So after, when we go to the stores and we buy the clothing off the rack, we're wearing the clothing, our pores, especially when we're sweating, um, our pores open up, we absorb a lot of these chemicals into our skin. Um, I'd, love, I'd love for you to touch on any of that, if you don't mind. I think you uh, touched on something that, again, you know, our skin is the biggest organ we have. So, again, if you have more natural fibers or natural dyes or, or your clothing is made in a, in a better and more sustainable way, then it's just going to be better for us. If we're wearing 
stuff that is already proven to be carcinogenic, uh, why are we putting that on our, on our bodies? Why are we, you know, again, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So we, I think we have to be looking again more at natural fibers and, and those manufacturers that are working in the best practices around the world. That's a good question. I mean, like, um, I, I, have a, I have an infant, and so, you know, um, it's all, everybody's, like, screaming at us, like, get organic cotton on that baby, you know? You can't have um, regular cotton on the baby, or, you know, the ba I don't know, the baby won't go to Yale or something. But, um, <laughs> but it's, like, it's very important that babies have organic cotton, but what about, like, adults, you know? Like, what about us, you know? We're fine. I don't know, you know? Um, the effects are real. Um, I mean, we're seeing really high levels now of eczema and dermatitis on adults and on children. And a lot of that is because of the chemicals to make our clothing easy care, non-iron, everything that makes life easier for us, you know, particularly as parents with children, is really harmful. So really high levels of formaldehyde um, to, to put those treatment processes onto the clothing to make it easy care or non-iron. So look out for anything which, you know, which, which means that you don't need to iron your clothing, that it looks good as soon as you've washed it, because that's really going to be, be where some of the most toxic chemicals are found. I would just also say, you know, there's over 70 million people in the U.S. alone today that have asthma and allergies. And, you know, we, we run around thinking that this is just about what we put in our bodies or the air we're breathing in. But when you look at the magnitude and multitude of chemicals that are going into our textiles, and as Roger said, you know, it's the largest organ in our body, our skin, and, and the primary organ for absorption. And we're breathing in all these chemicals. And then you ask yourself, you know, why is a third of the population chemically sensitive? It's not Actually, rocket science. Yeah, exactly. It's not rocket science. I was actually just in uh, another screening, actually, uh, in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. And to Carrie's point, somebody said, there are uh, no wrinkle-free sheep. <laughs> <laughs> They're working on it. Um, next question? Did you want, uh, I think you, you were waiting a little bit longer. I saw, I saw her in my periphery. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you all for speaking. And, um, the documentary was so um, insightful. I'll just and thank you all for sharing your insights. So my question is, um, how often do you buy new clothes? And um, when you do, where do you shop? Uh, I don't buy new clothes all that often. In fact, I don't think I've bought anything for a couple of years, although these are f relatively new. Um, and again, I'm looking online and trying to find, you know, who has good transparency where the factories are, if they're actually talking about their factories, and this particular brand did talk about their factories. I'm not going to say they're perfect, because they're probably not, but, they're, but at least they're talking about uh, water recovery and how they treat their dyes and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it was pretty what good. What brand? Uh, this is a brand called Everlane. And um, uh, so I liked that, that they were at least talking about where their factory is. They had videos of their factory. So you could see what's hopefully going on and how they're treating their water. So I thought that was pretty good. And back to the marketing thing, I saw something recently with one of the large brands, and it, I'm paraphrasing, but it basically just said, we treat water ethically. And I went, show it, prove it, because they, they weren't, and I know that they're not. So. So there's a number of really great websites now that are curating sustainable fashion. Um, uh, Zadie, Shop Ethica, Motivanti. Um, there's a store called Kate that also curates um, great sustainable fashion. Um, one of my favorite places to get clothing when I go to events like this is Rent the Runway. Um, you know, I pretty much always rent what I wear uh, so I can give it back. Did I rent the Runway? Yes. I think my wife wore that once for a party, <laughs> actually. It really looks good. Looks great. Uh -oh. yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, some of the, the brands that are doing great work out there are um, uh, Reformation, Eileen Fisher, uh, Mara Hoffman, Stella McCartney, um, and then on the outdoor side, uh, Outer Known, Patagonia, Prana are all doing amazing work. I don't talk, uh, that's way too personal. I don't talk about where I buy my clothes. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Carrie, did you want to jump in or no? 
Um, I think you've listed all of the really great brands. Yeah. I mean, I love buying vintage. There's some amazing vintage fairs in the UK, but unfortunately, I don't know much about the sort of vintage realm, but I'm sure New York has some amazing vintage stores, and yeah, that's my preferred place to go to. For sure. G great vintage. Uh, you, you had a question? Um, hi, my name is Beth. I don't know. Can you hear me? Um, so I just finished writing a book called The Green Wardrobe Guide, and 1% of the profits will be going to textile exchange. I love under the canopy, by the way. <laughs> I'm wearing my organic cotton. Um, but two things. So last week I went to a conference at FIT, and it was all about textile waste. And that was totally eye-opening to me, that even oftentimes when we donate clothing, it ends up being, um, if it doesn't sell at a thrift store, it ends up going to third world countries and things like that. So I think it's still the best thing that we can do, but the system is very imperfect from what I learned, which was amazing. And I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that. But um, second also is just this, again, this issue of transparency. Like I think if people knew more, um, there would be more efforts to go in a conscious direction. So I was wondering if you're hearing of any innovations in the transparency field. Like how are people, you know, how are, uh, designers learning to, like, are they putting information on their website? Is it on the tag? Could the government, you know, mandate that it is on labels? You know, I mean, we have to put the country of origin, so why not put how it was made? So those are my two questions. So I'll just speak to, on the transparency level first, um, I'm a huge advocate of third-party certification. So as an example, um, for a certified organic textile, I would look for the GOTS seal, the Global Organic Textile Standard, which says not the, it's not just about the cotton that's fully traceable, um, that it is certified organic at the National Organic Program level, just like any agricultural product, but the entire supply chain. And I know, because I'm also a GOTS certified manufacturer here in the US, it is a, a pretty serious undertaking that anyone who touches the product all the way to the warehouse has to be certified to the GOTS standard, and the entire supply chain is transparent and fully traceable at the finished product level. Um, you also have um, the HIG index, which is a kind of a behind the scenes effort that's going on in the industry right now that is measuring all the impacts, wastewater, energy, um, at the supply chain levels, and there is effort right now at the HIG index to uh, come up with a consumer-facing level that's going to be able to um, grade or score finished textiles based on the, the efforts in the supply chain. Um, and then the cradle-cradle certification is also a continuum. When you see a cradle-cradle certified product, it's measuring uh, water stewardship, renewable energy, material health, material reuse, and social justice. And so, you know, bronze, silver, gold, uh, up the, um, the continuum, you can also uh, get measurements for a finished product. Great, thank you. Yeah, I didn't know about the transparency index. It's great. <laughs> I'd also add to that to look at Wikirate. Wikirate is really reasonably new on the scene and it's open source data. And what it's doing is amalgamating a lot of public sources of data. So you can look at how brands are scoring, not just with one matrix, but across all of the different matrices, which are measuring transparency, sustainability, ethics, or, or any other um, um, sort of source, sources of data in terms of looking at how brands are performing. So Wikirate's a really interesting one to look out for. Quite limited in terms of what's on the platform at the moment, but it's going to be growing. and. Um, the Fashion Transparency Index will be integrated into the Wikirate platform for hopefully for next year's index. Thank you. Thank you. He said, I didn't pay him, I swear. The name of my book, <laughs> the name of my book is Green, The Green Wardrobe Guide, and it has a list of all the eco fashion stores in the United States that I could identify. So hopefully that's helpful to the last person that asked the question wow. when you buy it. <laughs> well, I think we have time for just a few more questions. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, to talk with this microphone. <laughs> my name is David McCann. I uh, have worked on climate change for a long time. So what my question was, um, I also now, I should, I should disclaim my interest. I work for a brand named Colors In. Um, we have a treatment for cotton fiber to make it easier to dye fiber uh, in yarn form and, um, and otherwise. Um, my question relates to sort of one of, the que one of the sort of conundrums that we have. Because we treat the fiber and there's many steps in the supply chain that we were talking about, and many of those steps are separated by elaborate and often secret subcontracting arrangements. Um, I guess I'm, 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 I'm trying to work out how do we work 
through this subcontracting? How do we work through these complex supply chains? This is a, an industry, arguably, which is more complex and more um, sophisticated with, with smaller margins than, than any other industry I can think of. Um, is that the future of fashion? Will it continue to be so fragmented and so many layers uh, separating, say, in my, in, in my company's case, fiber from um, the finished garments? Um, is the future going to be more vertical integration? Um, is there going to be more radical transparency through uh, contractual arrangements? How can final users get that, that transparency that they need to, to, to make good decisions? One last question, too. I want to just uh, call out to one more new initiative that's um, been started up in Amsterdam named Fashion for Good. I don't know if um, guys, uh, uh, you guys are aware of it, but it's, a, it's all about trying to scale uh, institution, uh, scale companies and ideas and innovations that work. So it's, it's not just about finding clever, cool things, and uh, but it's really an emphasis on scale, um, which I, I want to uh, recommend it to folks uh, they have a look at the website. Thank you. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, agreed, Fashion for Good is is really, um, I applaud the work that they're doing. They're, they're really driving innovation um, through that effort, which is amazing. Um, and also, I'm aware of Color Zen, and it's great work. And, I, and just to kind of address what you said, I think, yes, the future is all about collaboration and being at the table with, you know, the companies that are going to be um, as vertically integrated as possible to bring your story to life because, you know, the traditional cotton um, system is, you know, selling cotton, uh, farmers are selling to gins, and the gins, you know, are the, it's brokers that are selling to the yarn spinners and, and you know, and again, oftentimes middlemen from the yarn to the, the fabric. And I think, you know, for a story that's at the source level, you need to almost be at the top of the chain with buyers and all the other um, parties in the supply chain to make sure that there is streamlined uh, production and that there aren't a lot of middlemen in there. So yeah, I think vertical integration is not only a way to, to add value to product without adding cost because by cutting out all these middlemen, you're actually more efficient and you can leverage the story a lot more productively. One reflection on that. One, one thing which we've found successful is to actually try and build supply chains from both ends. So you build enthusiasm from the buyer side at the same time as giving them a pathway to buy the stuff that you're making, that your uh, uh, that your cotton fiber is in. But it's it's a really intensive process to get that those supply chains developed and to develop the range of products that people need to buy. Thanks for those thoughts. Hey, good evening. Um, my name is Martin Freeman. I'm a graduate student at the Bard MBA in Sustainability. Um, but my question for the panel is, you know, in terms of building a sustainable supply chain um, and empowering the, the upstream of the supply chain uh, down to the farmers, what is it that you see the role of technology um, playing a role there in, in terms of like blockchain and smart contracts? to help out with the transparency and sustainability. Yeah, thank you for that. And actually, I think technology is going to play a huge role in sustainability. And again, I think there's maybe not everything's figured out just yet, but I, I, I think a lot of these problems come from engineering problems. We've asked engineers to build factories, and we've asked engineers to do this and that, but we haven't really asked them to take care of the pollution problem. So I think we have to go back to our engineers and start asking them to build better factories as well. So I think technology is going to play a bigger role. I also think, again, back to kind of natural fabrics and fibers and stuff like that. I recently met a woman who is actually making uh, fibers out of nettle. And nettle is basically, again, it's a big weed like hemp, but it was she found it easier to, to uh, process and dye than hemp was. So again, I think Technology is going to be play a very big role as we move forward. Yeah, I think technology is going to really be hugely important in terms of transparency because even though you know there's a lot of brands who are becoming more transparent, there's still 
you know, a huge number of laggards. There's actually brands who scored zero in the Fashion Transparency Index. So we're going to see more DNA testing of cotton, for instance, to prove where the cotton comes from. I mean, a lot of cotton from Uzbekistan is routinely labelled made in Bangladesh, and we really need to know where our raw materials come from. Um, blockchain, as you said, you know, that's going to be hugely important because the fashion industry is made up of a lot of different actors who have very little trust in each other, and blockchain is, is ex you know, positioned for exactly that sort of, of a supply chain. So I think that's going to be really important um, you know, in, the, in the next few years in terms of being able to prove transparency of, of fashion garments. And, and there are some technologies that are now um, starting to get into the supply chain trenches at the cotton level and um, do LCAs, life cycle analysis, um, where they're able to um, create the, measure, the measurements, the measurable data around you know, water and energy and climate change impacts and carry that data up the chain. And I think that's super important in terms of our ability to measure and communicate what the savings and the benefits are. And I think, you know, there's now companies like Kering um, that own Stel McCartney and, and Gucci and um, Outer Known um, that uh, have these EP&Ls, these environmental profit and losses that they're actually communicating now at their, um, their, their final reporting level um, that's going out to their shareholders. Um, so, and then in terms of technologies at the fiber level, I mean, I'll give a plug to my friend Trish up there from Lensing. Um, you know, lensing uh, has taken eu uh, eucalyptus and uh, extracted the cellulose from eucalyptus and broken it down and uh, turned it into a really amazing um, fiber that is uh, created in a closed loop system um, using just a, a solvent to break it down without chemicals. And um, it's a man-made technology, but it's created kind of, in my opinion, almost like the parallel of a, of a natural fiber um, and uh, something that's very eco-friendly. And it smells great, too. So um, uh, we'll just take two more questions. I, I really appreciate the enthusiasm that you guys are, are, are uh, asking some, some great questions, but, um, you know, it's time. Um, so uh, you, and uh, then we'll, we'll go over here. So I had a comment and a question. Okay. Uh, the first comment was regarding storytelling. You said there's a lot of opportunity for companies to use storytelling to uh, leverage sustainability with the consumer. And I just wanted to also caution, though, about you know the risk of greenwashing and additional questions that one needs to add, ask. So just because I say, okay, my Mr. Lee is sitting in a factory in Guangzhou, and he's being treated ethically, doesn't mean anything, right? As a consumer, I think the consumer also needs to ask questions about what standards are they following, right? Like if a brand says, um, you know, they're being treated ethically, what does it really mean? And I feel consumers don't really know a lot about, you know, industry efforts or general standards that are happening. Um, but unfortunately, so, so that was actually just a comment that, you know, I feel like a lot of education needs to be done about valid standards and what these should be. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so yeah, but what would you, and the other question they should also ask, I mean, I think what I see is a lot of brands have, you know, can, can tell great stories with innovation, right? But what is the percentage of the total purchase orders that actually are going to be impacted by this innovation? Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of the glitzy stuff that brands are talking about, using recycled bottles for recycled poly, uh, no, no, bottles for recycled poly, um, but, if I could, if I could wrap my arms around your question, what what would be the question exactly? So, what are the key, like the the movie you touched upon, um, water pollution, right, at the factory level, at the mill level, at the tannery level, right, Le uh, leather. So, as a consumer who understands fair trade and just very easy certifications and not really hick index and so, uh, what else, what is it that I should be asking for to you know buy sustainable denim? Great question. Again, you know, again, the, the questions that you need to ask is not, you know, just how sustainable is it? I mean, it goes back to organic uh, cotton, I think, or organic or natural fibers. And I think you also have to look at the, the dyes that are being used and, and what chemical usage that is being used. 
And I know, again, the certification programs, I think they're great. They may not be perfect, but I, I think they're a super start. Um, I think there's a couple of other ones like Blue Sign and Okatex that also look at the chemical usage, and I think they break down that fairly well. Um, and they look at fair trade and, and, and the factories and all of that kind of stuff. So again, I think the certification programs are actually a really good start. They may not be perfect either, but again, it's a good start for us to look at those and then maybe ask your questions based on what you find from that. So again, it comes back to us doing our own research uh, as well on what is truly sustainable fashion. And if you want to do your own research, Fashion Revolution has a MOOC, a massive open online course, which I've heard is really, really good. I haven't done it myself, but it's, it's had really fantastic reviews. So if you want a sort of structured way of finding out more about who made your clothes, then that's a really good place to start. Okay, our final question. All right. um, yeah, hi. Uh, I guess my question will be pretty uh, much simpler than everybody else. Um, I saw, so I'm a student right now myself on the first semester in fashion design. Uh, I saw that uh, on the website of Fashion Revolution, uh, to start to make an impact, I can create a group in my own university and uh, rise an awareness of other students about um, your activity. Uh, Besides that, my question would be, as an aspiring designer, um, and as a student who is starting to create garments inside the lab, lab of a university, what kind of change I can start making with the like, primary sources that, as a student, beside like, few shops which uh, sells you know, like conven uh, conventional textiles and uh, buttons and whatever it takes to create um, uh, a design, like what can I do and like, where can I get my um, primary sources to um, you know, start to create um, a garment which would be um, responding to the, um, the question we, we are all where, where can you get started? Where, where could she get started? So, um, you know, as, as some of the, the efforts have been mentioned, like the textile exchange, um, the Brooklyn Fashion and Design Accelerator is a great resource. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's a, a whole student effort around the Copenhagen Fashion Summit right now. So there, um, you know, there are students that are coming together. I would, I would look at that. Um, in Fashion Revolution Day, as you know, as or, as um, Carrie said, um, they have a lot of resources as well. Um, and there's, you know, a number of books that have started to come out um, in this space, and you know, I think all of us. Um, here would I at least I'll speak for myself um, you can reach out to me and I can give you additional resources so uh, Marcy at Marcy so, yeah. Um anyone else care to chime in before we wrap this up well um, guys this has been uh, the please a round of applause for the panel <laughs> for Carrie Summers Marcy Zaroff and of course once again for Roger Williams and his amazing film, River Blue. I'd also uh, like to thank uh, Fashion Revolution for, for producing tonight, and uh, also Parsons, uh, so a round of applause for them as well. My name's Jordan Carlos. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Um, you guys have been awesome. Have a great night.